Hello everyone and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics and much much more. Today we are continuing our discussion of portfolio performance evaluation techniques and considering some of the measures that adjust for downside risk, unlike previously investigated Sharp Ratio, Trainer Ratio and Jensen's Alpha, that arguably adjust for both downside risk and upside risk. The logic is very simple. The reason why investors hate risk, arguably, is because they don't want the value of their holdings to unexpectedly decline. They don't really mind an unexpected increase in their portfolio value, whereas um, the general measures of risk, like standard deviation, volatility, they would increase if both unexpected downsides and unexpected upsides are prevalent. The measures that we are discussing today aim at resolving this limitation and develop measures that adjust for downside risk only, so only for unexpected declines in your portfolio value. The simplest measure of downside risk, arguably, is drawdown. Drawdown is a commonly used measure in practitioner circles, mostly, that measures how far below the previous peak of your portfolio value have you dropped in a particular time period. So, to measure drawdowns, we first need to establish what are all-time peaks that we have reached with our portfolio value in all different scenarios so far. So, to encompass that in Excel, we need to use the max function and measure what is the maximum portfolio value for each of our three portfolios. Again, um, Alice's portfolio investing in global equities, Bob's portfolio investing in a mixture of corporate and sovereign bonds, and our benchmark, which is S&P 500, a proxy for the total uh, US stock market. So we need to measure what is the maximum portfolio value so far, so as of a particular date, for all three portfolios. So we use the max function and we lock the row in one of the two inputs. What it will do for us is, as we drag it across and down, uh, it will measure the maximum value that we have ever reached up to a certain date, and then we will be able to measure drawdowns at the end of every single month to have an idea of how far below the previous peak do troughs, so drawdowns, downsides of our performance go. So, a max of B2 with locked row, B2 without locked row. And then we can drag it to the right and bottom right click it all the way down. And we see that, well, after the financial crisis of 2007-2008, uh, it took all of the portfolios quite a while to reach their previous peaks, which again provides some simple illustrative logic to the whole concept. Then, knowing the peaks, we can calculate the drawdowns. The drawdowns would be the current value of the portfolio divided by the peak that corresponds to a particular date and to a particular portfolio minus one. That logic is very simple to calculating returns However, we measure the percentage decline in comparison to an all-time peak so far. So, we enforce this formula, drag it across and down, and see that, first of all, drawdown is always non-positive. So, it's equal to zero if we just are at the all-time peak right now, and it's negative when we are below the peak. And it shows how far below the peak we have gone. Now, we need to calculate maximum and average drawdowns that will allow us to calculate the respective downside risk adjusted measures. 
So for maximum drawdown, it's very simple. First of all, we need to calculate the all-time maximum drawdown. And given the fact that drawdowns are not positive, they are non-positive, we need to calculate the minus of the minimum value of the drawdowns for a particular portfolio. We can see that for Alice's portfolio that invests in global equities, the maximum drawdown is almost 50%. And for S&P 500, which is American equity benchmark, it's approximately the same. While for the bond portfolio, drawdown is much lower at only slightly above 5%. That provides a different perspective on risk exposures. While the risk in terms of volatility is roughly six times lower for a bond portfolio than for a stock portfolio, in terms of drawdowns, the risk is 10 times lower. Uh, again, reflecting the fact that volatility or standard deviation does not fully capture the downside risk. It also dilutes the calculations with some upside risk blended into the picture. Now, for average drawdown, we want to know how far below the all-time peak do we drop on average. So, minus, again, as the drawdown measure is negative and we want it in positive terms for it to be a risk measure, the higher the risk here, average if, and we want to know the average of the negatives. So, if our drawdown measure is negative, we want to calculate the average of them all. And do the same for all three portfolios. And here we can interpret the average drawdown as the following. On average, when we fall below the peak, equity portfolios uh, draw below their peak around 11% on average, while the drawdown for a bond portfolio is on average slightly higher than or just 1%. Now, having computed the drawdown measures, we can apply this very familiar logic of risk-adjusted return measures. Well, the risk-adjusted return measure is most often just access return in the numerator, so annualized return minus annualized risk rate divided by some measure of risk. And uh, we saw this logic in sharp ratio when we were dividing by annualized volatility, so annualized standard deviation, and in train ratio when we divided by beta. In that case, we can do just the same using drawdowns. And that's the logic that is present in Kalmar ratio and Sterling ratio. Those two ratios use maximum and average drawdown respectively to calculate risk-adjusted return measures. So, what is your risk premium, what is your reward, compared to a risk-free rate per unit of drawdown? And those can be simplest, albeit very informative, downside risk-adjusted performance evaluation measures. So, for Kalma ratio, we can do exactly the same. Annualized return minus the annualized risk rate divided by maximum drawdown. And for Sterling ratio, we can subtract risk free rate from annualized return and divide it by the average drawdown. And we can drag it across and see that for drawdown uh, risk adjusted measures, uh, Alice's portfolio, which is global equities, actually outperforms both the bond portfolio and the benchmark, while in case of uh, sharp ratio or trainer ratio and even alpha to some extent, we had a reverse picture with bond portfolio being uh, more attractive for trainer and Jensen and uh, the benchmark being more attractive in case of Sharp. Uh, in that case, we can deduce that a global equity portfolio is more attractive if we adjust for downside risk only and uh, that some of the volatility that's measured here in um, standard deviation is actually upside risk in disguise, as obviously emerging markets have a lot of upside volatility with respect to um, developed markets, equities, 
So that's uh, a very intuitive reasoning that one can establish to justify these differences in different measures. Another famous risk-adjusted return measure that takes into account downside risk only is the Satina ratio. Uh, Satina ratio takes the logic of standard deviation and applies it to negative returns or returns below a certain target only. So to calculate the Satina ratio, we first need to establish what is our target and uh, calculate the returns that are below the target. Uh, most of the time we can say that the target is just zero, but in case of uh, our portfolio, let's assume that our target is the risk-free rate. Well, the logic is very simple. If we invest our capital into risky assets, being stocks or bonds, we want to get a return that's higher than the risk-free alternative, obviously. So when we exceed the target return, that is the risk-free rate, we are moderately happy about it and do not consider it a downside. But if we underperform the risk-free rate, during some time period, we can be reasonably unhappy about it as we could have done much better both in terms of risk and reward if we had just invested our cash in US government bonds, for example. So to apply this logic in Excel, we can just calculate the downsides. So if our return is lower than the corresponding monthly risk free rate and here we need to lock the column on the risk free rate as it's universal across all three portfolios but varies with time then if we underperform the risk free rate we need to know the downside so how far below the risk free rate we have fallen and if we are exceeding the return of the risk free asset we can just discard this observation as it's not a downside. Those are just empty inverted commas that would return an empty cell in Excel that would basically signal that there is no observation in that particular cell. That's just a technical note. So, having applied this formula, we can drag it across and down and see how are the downsides of all three portfolios organized. The downsides will allow us to calculate so-called semi-variance and semi-deviations, which are basically the downside volatility of our portfolios. And um, to do so, we first of all need to calculate the number of downsides in each of the three cases. To do that, we can just apply the count function and count all observations in each and every column. We can actually apply just the count function, not the count if function, because we left the cells where we had no drawdown as empty. If we didn't, for example, we had zeros there, we would have needed to apply the count if function and uh, count only the cells where the return is negative, just as we did in case of average if function with drawdowns when we calculated the average drawdown. Here we can just apply the count function and see that in each of those cases we have a varying number of downsides, so varying number of months when our return was lower than the risk-free rate and surprisingly we have um, the highest number of months with returns lagging below the risk rate in case of the bond portfolio. But thinking about it for a second time, it's not that surprising as average returns of uh, bonds are much lower. So it's much more likely that at some particular month, the yield on bonds would be lower than the yield of government bonds. We're not concerned with the number of downsides per se, we are concerned with semi-variance and semi-deviation and their relationship to excess returns. So to calculate the semi-variance, we need to apply uh, the logic of variance, but we can't just apply, for example, the variance formula 
um, to the array of downsides because then it would uh, calculate the deviations from average negative return and we want to calculate the deviation from the target return in our case the risk free rate we need to apply the sum squared formula that will calculate the sum of squared downsides so apply it to the whole array and then we need to divide that by the number of downsides uh, as you see it reminds you a lot of the usual formula for the variance but we are not calculating the deviation from uh, average downside but the deviation from the target return which is the risk free rate in our case so that is the semi-variance of the global equity portfolio and we can drag it across to have semi-variances for all three of our portfolios that we investigate now we need to calculate the semi-deviation which again is the square root of semi-variance semi-deviation to semi-variance is the same as the standard deviation is to variance but to make it comparable to annualized volatility we have calculated previously we also need to annualize it uh, bear in mind that as we have monthly data our semi-variance and semi-deviation are monthly so to make it annualized we need to multiply it by the square root of 12 again same logic as we have with uh, volatility uh, usual standard deviation and uh, dragging it across we have our semi deviations downside risk measures for all three portfolios and as we see here the semi deviation is higher than usual standard deviation for both um, equity portfolios and um, slightly lower for the bond portfolio which means that there is more downside risk at least proportionately in equity investment than there is in bond investment and that's not really surprising at all then for satina ratio we just need to remember the logic of the sharp ratio and uh, modify it for downside risk uh, as satina ratio involves target return then we can treat it as uh, annualized return minus annualized target return divided by semi deviation but in our case as our target return is the risk free rate we can still use the annual risk free rate in the calculations in the numerator and divided by the semi deviation in the denominator and dragging it across and converting it into decimals to make it comparable with the sharp ratio more easily we can still get uh, the satina ratio we can see that the figures are very comparable in terms of magnitude to the sharp ratio and the relationship between uh, satina ratios of those three portfolios is also resembles the relationship between the sharp ratios in terms of satina ratio the global equity portfolio does underperform s p 500 but just marginally while the bond portfolio again lags much behind and that's all there is for drawdowns semi deviations and downside risk adjusted return measures leave a like under this video if you found it helpful in the comments below please leave your suggestions for any other topics in business economics or finance that you want me to investigate in future videos and please don't forget to subscribe to our channel thank you very much and stay tuned